So I'm here with my buddy Ross Butler. You might recognize him from 13 Reasons Why and maybe some other things, but uh, he and I have known each other for a little while. I kind of started working with him here and there when he was uh, the cast of 13 Reasons Why. And yeah. Anyway, Ross, and Shazam. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's actually when we first started working together was uh, prepping for Shazam. Um, Cause yeah, I needed to get in really good shape. Uh, this was before I knew that we had a muscle suit. <laughs> so, so yeah, I definitely talked to Tom and uh, yeah, you, you put me on some crazy stuff that has I honestly changed my life as far as diet and exercise and lifestyle. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've, I've Thomas, we've worked together for four years now, three yeah. or four years. Yeah, we've had a fair bit of uh, grueling workouts in this <laughs> humble, humble abode that we're in right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, when we first started working on Shazam, I, I, I'd have to say one of the, the number one things that I've carried on to today that has really changed uh, my mindset is, is intermittent fasting. Yeah. You know, but even like, you know, before I was introduced to keto, you got me on intermittent fasting. Um, and yeah, that honestly, because I've never been a big breakfast person, that like just solidified everything I felt that, you know, I was just much clearer the first half of the day. And um, yeah, my workouts are more intense. I feel lighter. Uh, so yeah, that honestly has like changed my life a lot in the last four years. So yeah. what is it that you're, you're working on now? Because mm. I mean, we've, we've obviously come and gone in each other's lives where you're working on different projects. You've always got something different going on. Your life is crazy, man. You're like yeah. jet setting all over the place. And I mean, in speaking to intermittent fasting, that's exactly why it works so well, right? Yeah. It's just, I think it works well for you because it's more than anything it's relatively easy for you to adhere to yeah. with a pretty complex life that you have. Yeah. Um, but what are you working on right now? Because we, we came together again a couple of months ago. Be like, mm -hmm. Thomas, I've, you know, I've got some projects. I need to get in awesome shape again. Let's yeah. really like dial it in. Uh, I know obviously the way it works, you can't always talk about things that you're working on, but how did we start working together again? Because we've got, just kind of spoiler alert, I mean, we've got some DEXA scans from you for like the last five, six weeks. It's nuts, like yeah. totally nuts. <laughs> uh, so the next movie I'm working on, it's called uh, Perfect Addiction. It's an MMA movie where I'm a fighter. Um, and uh, <laughs> to be completely honest, for the last six months, eight months, uh, I've been doing a lot of jet setting, but it's been a lot more vacation time. <laughs> like I've been in, in uh, Paris and, and Milan and Taiwan, and I've just been eating a lot. <laughs> just kind of enjoying myself, you know, because it, it's, it's a, I, I think, it's important to, to moderate like, you know, your good times and the important times when you really want to focus on stuff and, you know, being in a really stressful career path, like, you know, yeah, it'll let loose every once in a while. So for the last five months, six months, I've been letting loose, eating a lot of carbs. And then um, when I book, sign on to this movie, I'm like, I need Thomas back in my life because I need to get like really good shape in really good shape again. Um, so yeah, a few months I reached out. I said, I'm in Taiwan. Uh, as soon as I'm back, I, I need to get back on this keto intermittent fasting thing, start working out. Uh, so what can we do? What new science have you learned over the last couple of years since we've since we've worked together on a professional basis. Um, so yeah, I, uh, so as soon as I got back from Taiwan, we jumped right into it five, six weeks ago. I started doing DEXA scans so that I could monitor week by week how uh, my, lean tissue, my lean muscle tissue is going, my fat, my uh, VAT, all those levels. Um, and yeah, the results are kind of insane. They're pretty nuts. Yeah, honestly. yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So going back. So yeah, Thomas is always my guy. Like whenever I have to be in really good shape for a role, like I always love to hear the new science, whether it's you know um, for muscle building, for fat loss, or even or whether it's what you want to hear or not. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> With you, it's not always that. I don't, I don't necessarily look to you for comfort, Tom. But <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we'll jump right into. I want to open up with where you where you started right yeah. and then I, I have no problem sharing you know what i did for you as far as diet's concerned because yeah. there's no like hidden secrets it's all stuff i talk about on my channel it's yeah. all stuff being able to put it into practical application but it's a perfect example to demonstrate how the hundreds of different things I talk about, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm releasing a video just about every day with something different. It can be confusing for some because they're like, how do I assemble all of this? Well, you're not assembling all of it. You're having a repository of different things that you can choose from. Yes. So then when I look at your situation, I say, oh, okay, well, this is practical. This is practical. Oh, you're you know, in this situation, so this is practical. Mm -hmm. So it's a perfect time for me to say, like when you're watching my videos, 
it's not that you have to apply every single thing I talk about. It's like you build a repository, an encyclopedia in your own mind of what you learn here and have practical scenarios in which you apply it. Yeah. So, so what, I mean, what I'll add to that is also over the past few years, there's these pillars of concepts, right, that you can fit. And because, like we said, my lifestyle is kind of all over the place. I'm flying a lot, I'm working a lot, my like an acting schedule is very erratic. I take these pillars and I kind of plug and play the different um, macros or, or the eating windows or the eating times and it all works and then watching the additional videos you put out just because I also am a big science guy I love to hear the science of it but um, if you keep up with they all start to make sense and they all start to, to fit together like a puzzle piece so then in the end you have this big picture of what you need to do and the goals you're trying to get um, and these pillars and you just kind of follow what you can. Totally. You know? So, and that's been a big help, just being able to, again, build up the repository so I know kind of what things to avoid, what things I can lean into. Um, and yeah, that makes it like fitting into my schedule a lot easier as the more and more we go on. Yeah, you made some comments even just when we were just sitting in the other room going over some revisions for your travel schedule. Yeah. I mean, it was like, oh, you, you get it. You're like, oh, so this would be a good time when I should skip breakfast in this case, or I should mm -hmm. be doing a fasted workout here. It's like, it's all clicked. Yeah. And I'm not saying that to make viewers feel like, oh, well, it's not clicking for me. Darn it, I'm doing it wrong. The point is, is that you just, again, you don't have to apply everything. So yeah. when you started, so we're, we'll start the first measured date, and then I want to explain what I laid out for you, but mm -hmm. this was on, a, let's see, the first measured date was, yeah, 222, so February 22nd of 2022. Um, total body fat was 21.1%. Uh, so, Total mass, 194.3. Fat tissue is 41.1. And this is overlaying on the screen, so it's all good. Lean tissue, 145.1. Uh, Those are the basic things. Now, we could get down into the, the arms, the legs, the trunk, but we're not really worried about that. And you, you mentioned earlier, I want to make sure that people understand, you mentioned VAT. That stands for visceral adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. On this channel, I talk a lot about visceral. That's <laughs> the fat that's kind of underneath the belly, but yeah. it can cause a lot of distension so it's kind of the pot belly, but it's also the fat that really is metabolically active as far as inflammatory cytokines. So as a health marker, almost all dietary patterns agree across the board, whether they're vegan, whether they're keto, whether they're paleo, that visceral fat is one thing we can all unanimously agree on as being something we need to reduce. Yeah. So regardless of what dietary pattern you're doing, seeing a reduction in visceral adipose tissue is a very good thing because it signals metabolic changes occurring and inflammatory changes occurring. Uh, so for those that don't have a ton of time to watch the video, I'll go ahead and say like his uh, VAT scores have improved so dramatically over the last like five, six weeks. Insane. Nuts. Yeah. And the great thing about the DEXA scan, because I've been doing these weekly, is it's a great benchmark and to see how much, because it measures the VAT by uh, cube, by weight and cubic <laughs> inches. So just to see, like you can visualize the cubic inches of VAT that I've lost over the last five or six weeks. And this is the first time I've done that. So like just being able to like have a, uh, a, a visceral, not to <laughs> not do a pun there, but, but like an actual marker, like a visual marker is, is uh, really motivating. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I've always, uh, you've probably seen, you probably show some footage where I'm like, have that five pound <laughs> chunk of fat that I have, right? I have like a, a random synthetic five pound chunk of fat and I use that just for context and videos to show this is what five pounds looks like. In terms of volume, it's a lot. Yeah. So before we get into kind of the first, the, the next DEXA readout, I'll explain what I did with him and kind of the reasonings behind it. Uh, so Ross is doing a lot of combination of strength training plus right now pretty cardio metabolic focused uh, like MMA style training. Yeah so a lot of boxing, a lot of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, just a lot of plyometric stuff. Um, yeah it's, it's a crazy mix of cardio and uh, strength I guess like depending on what we're focusing on that day. Got it. Yeah. So when I was originally building out this protocol I was like okay let's stick it to predominantly like keto as the foundation because of mm -hmm. course you being that fat loss was your goal and that you needed to also try to at least either maintain, if not, if possible, build muscle, mm -hmm. then you know, that's going to be the best bet. And the reason that I went for that, and there's some people will disagree, and that's okay because you know, there's many different schools of thought on this. Uh, but as far as muscle preservation goes, doing a lower carb protocol where we're bringing ketones relatively high mm -hmm. is beneficial simply because they're so what's called leucine sparing. Mm -hmm. And that means that you're preserving leucine, which is the predominant amino acid associated with muscle anabolism and maintaining muscle mass. So for someone, and even in the bodybuilding community, right, ketogenic diets are used a lot because they are known for drop, being able to drop fat but also preserve muscle pretty well. Uh, 
jury is still out in terms of like super long term. Like over time, yeah, it might not be as muscle preserving, but for shorter stents, absolutely we can do this. So we focused on mainly ketogenic as the foundation. But one thing that we did that was very unique that we hadn't done in the past, which is based upon relatively newer research, is rather than having you fast in the morning, I had you fast through dinner and skip yeah. dinner three days a week. Yeah. And that sucked for at first because <laughs> nighttime is when I get all my cravings. I'm like a savory guy. So it's just at night is like, oh, I want chips or I want, you know, so something. But yeah, yeah so the, the first week of that kind of sucked. <laughs> but I got, I got over it and yeah, I'm happy I did. One of the things that I've had Ross use within his diet as well as pretty much anyone else that I talk to is Element. They are really cool electrolytes that work super well for fasting. They're totally fasting friendly. They won't break a fast, but the flavors are awesome. So whether you are fasting, doing low carb, or you're just working out and you want a good electrolyte that doesn't have sugar, you can check them out. This is a free sample trial for them. So you can try eight packets of Element, totally risk-free, no questions asked, just pay a couple bucks for shipping. So you get eight sample packets of Element with 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium, which is a great ratio, especially if you're fasting and you wanna make sure you're replenishing the sodium that you typically lose when your insulin levels are low during a fast. But either way, just proper hydration is everything. And some of the stuff that Ross and I talk about in this interview is related to hydration. Feeling sluggish can be related to hydration, and minerals play a role in making sure you're adequately hydrated. So check out that link down below to get your free sample packet of Element. The, the reasoning behind that, too, it's that we actually were just talking about this and I realized when I wrote that up for you didn't even really give you the reason Ross just kind of says Thomas you tell me what to do and, and I trust you at this point but it was uh, I explained it a little bit more and for someone like him that's working out in the morning or in the earlier part of the day it worked very well to have him skip dinner just a few days a week we had him skip dinner three days a week because what would happen is because of the absence of food you would get really insulin sensitive mm. okay when you get insulin sensitive, it makes it so that when you do finally eat, the muscles are like, ah, give me whatever's available, like suck it up, suck it up. So if you were coming in and you had say, had a normal dinner, and we had you doing traditional intermittent fasting, maybe where you're skipping breakfast, and you were working out at like 7 a.m. in the morning, well, you're really only working out, in the best case scenario, maybe 12 hours into a fast. That's great, that's tremendous, don't get me wrong. Like I highly recommend people still do that. But if we have you skip dinner and your last meal was at 2, 3 p.m., then you're going into that workout potentially 16, 17 hours into a fast, right? Yeah. So you're that much further into a fast, meaning you're getting that much more, A, potential fat loss, but more importantly, more insulin sensitivity. The longer that you get into a fast, the more insulin sensitive you are. You also become very insulin sensitive when you are working out. So we got a double whammy. Insulin sensitivity from being deeper into a fast plus insulin sensitivity from a workout. Right. And it allows us to have it so you're breaking your fast shortly after your workout when you're super insulin sensitive. Mm -hmm. What that means is the uptake of nutrients in your post-workout meal at the cellular level is going to be significantly better. So there is a reason for that. I'm like, okay, how do I get this the most bang for the buck, so to speak, in terms of like with your workouts, nutrient uptake, and allow, we had a small amount of carbohydrates in the post-workout. We had fruit predominantly. Yeah. Raspberries, yeah. love that. Like the protein shake with the raspberries. And the thing is, I could almost feel it. Like I could feel my body being like, yes, just get in. I would get pumped uh, after a workout and then I would eat. But um, yeah, adding that little bit of fruit in there, like especially right after the workout was, it, it felt great. What's crazy is that people don't realize that you can get away with having, well, we have like three quarters of a cup of fruit or something like yeah, that in there. Yeah. And had you been measuring ketones a couple hours after that, I don't know if you were or not, you probably would still be in ketosis. That's what's crazy mm -hmm. is the uptake is that good. The more insulin sensitive that you are, the more the muscles will suck that glucose up. Yeah. So you're granted, for lack of a better term, almost more amnesty where you can be like, okay, I can have this glucose, my body's gonna suck it up, it's not gonna remain in the bloodstream because in the case of ketosis, elevated levels of glucose are going to halt the formation of new ketones, ketogenesis. Mm. So what we're trying to do is, okay, if you are gonna have glucose, which I'm perfectly okay with, or, or fructose or carbohydrates in general to fuel you after a workout, I'm cool with that. We just gotta make sure they're going to the right place because if they're floating around in the bloodstream, it's gonna slow down the production of ketones. Right. And remember, the production of ketones is what is preserving the muscle for you on this given diet. Yes, yeah, yeah. 
Plus, also the Keto Start stuff helps. Yeah, Keto Start, definitely, uh, Dr. Dante Agostino turned me on to this brand. Really cool stuff. This is a good form of exogenous ketone, which we could go down that rabbit hole a little bit, but essentially by adding some exogenous ketones during periods of time in which he would be the most catabolic mm. when you would be at the risk of burning the most muscle mm. by adding those in, which is yeah. another additional buffer just yeah. to, because with, with Ross, someone that's already trained, and you, you know, you're not starting from scratch, mm -hmm. you have a fair bit of muscle on you already. The goal is, well, how do we get you shredded in a short amount of time and with save, yeah, save the muscle, yeah. you know, yeah. as much as we can. Yeah. What's crazy is I went into this thinking and I even set expectations like it's, you're going to lose some muscle, right? Yeah. You're going to, it's just going to happen. Well, let's go into the next mm -hmm. <laughs> one week later, DEXA scan. Okay. So that was 222, 22. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of twos. Um, and then the next one, 228. So a just about later. a week later. Okay. So this one, we went to 20.1% body fat down from 21.1. So we dropped a percent body fat. Okay. Total uh, mass was 194.3. So lean tissue actually in this one stayed the same. Uh, sorry, sorry, lean tissue went up a half a pound. So we went from 145.1 lean tissue to 145.6 lean tissue. So we dropped 1% body fat and went up a half a pound of lean tissue. In, in a week. In a week. Yeah. And so at first glance, I would say, like, what do they say? Newbie gains, right? Yeah. There's a, but newbie gains are not necessarily like cardio or metabolic related. Those are much more neuronal related and neurologically related. And what I mean by that is when someone first starts something, there's like a neural adaptation, like newbie gains in the gym, they get stronger really quick. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. as far as this argument is concerned, we would normally say, okay, we saw some fat loss or we saw some weight loss. And the common argument that comes up is, okay, well, yeah, on a ketogenic diet, you're eliminating carbohydrates or reducing them dramatically. So you're losing muscle glycogen. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. You drop weight. So people can sometimes lose 10, 12 pounds in the first week doing keto. But you lost actual fat mass on a DEXA scan, which is essentially an MRI of your body in a very colloquial way. And you actually gained lean tissue. Yep. which is pretty phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It tells me two things, and I ramble a little bit, but it tells me two things. Either one, you legitimately are putting on mass that fast, or two, which is also be a good thing, you are so fat adapted and good at utilizing ketones and fat as a fuel source that your body was so efficient at utilizing fats that it was able to allocate some protein into muscle glycogen through gluconeogenesis thereby filling up your muscle tissue. Right. I don't know if that makes sense at all. Basically, other substrates were able to contribute to glycogen. Mm. So most people that would go on keto, would, their glycogen stores would shrink. Yeah. They would lose weight, they would lose, it would report a drop in, in lean tissue, mm -hmm. as well as a drop in fat. Mm -hmm. You are so fat adapted from doing keto for a period of time and from going off and on and making yourself metabolically flexible, that you were able to put on muscle but also probably maintain your muscle glycogen. Mm. Now that's at this point in time, right? Yep. I wouldn't have told you this, but I would have definitely expected the next readout to show a decrease in lean tissue, but we'll get to that one in a second. So yep. at this point, how would you say you were feeling? Tired? Uh, yeah, so the first week I was tired. I was a little bit tired. I think it was a mix of um, going from eating so many carbs in, in Taiwan and it, like I was eating noodles and dumplings every day. Um, and then also like jet lag and then switching into keto. There was a lot of different factors. Um, but yeah, the first week I was a little tired and, and my stamina definitely went down uh, from doing MMA, MMA I, could, I could tell, because like, we were doing conditioning training. Um, yeah, so the first week, but I, I was prepared for that. The first week is always a little rough. Yeah. yeah. You, you had made a comment to me. Uh, I had set a fair amount of food, not ridiculously high calories. I think we were between, like, we were like 2,500-ish, give mm -hmm. or take, right? Depending on the day. So calories were high enough to maintain tissue, but also low enough to definitely put you in a deficit. And make no mistake, I'm not someone that's going to say thermodynamics don't matter. Like definitely still put him in a deficit to lose weight. The fact that we were able to preserve muscle along with it is great. Uh, so with those calories, but you said to me at one point, like, hey, like I can't even eat all this food. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I was on a meal plan with um, you know, a buddy of mine, uh, Chef Mikey, and, and he's been making me these pre-made meals so I can just you know, shut my brain off 
I can just eat. I have nothing else in my fridge except for like, you know, what I make for breakfast and then, and then these, uh, these meals. But yeah, I was getting to the point where I was like, hey Tom, I, I just can't finish all of this, um, which is weird because I was working out twice a day and I was doing, you know, cardio and strength-based workouts, but I couldn't finish the, the food that I was given. Um, I, I was just, I felt like I was force feeding myself. Yeah. So. And we don't want to be in that situation, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like you got to listen to your body. Yeah. Uh, what was probably happening there, again, this may or may not happen to someone that is uh, not experienced with keto. And I don't want to say, I mean, you are experienced with keto. You're yeah. not a keto like freak. You're not no. uh, on it all the time, but you know the practical use cases for it. So you're experienced with it in that sense. For someone that isn't experienced with it, they might have been experiencing extreme hunger. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact that your body was able to shift, again, that metabolic flexibility, which in my opinion, is always the goal with doing a lower carb ketogenic approach. It's not to be dogmatic about a way of nutrition, it's to make it so that your cells have the ability to flip flop back and forth. Hey, I need to use glucose at this point in time, I need to use fat at this point in time. Very quickly into this program did your body shift over into preferentially using fats. With a fuel that yields nine calories per gram, being fats versus carbs yielding four, Suddenly, at a fuel gauge level in your body, your body says, I have plenty of food. I'm, I'm running on fats now, so hey, you don't need to give me so much. Yeah. That's a pretty remarkable sign. So when you told me that, it wasn't like offensive. I didn't take insult to it. It's one of those things like, actually, great. Okay, so mm -hmm. I think I told you at that point, well, I still, I still need you to meet your macros as far as protein is concerned because of the amount of training. So if you can, just take what Chef Mikey's made for you and you know, give the other food to a friend and eat the protein out of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, that, and yeah, I was trying my hardest to do that, but um, yeah. It's definitely one of those things where, and it could change. One of the questions that I asked Ross, and I ask anyone that I've worked with, uh, no matter what situation is, you know, what time of day are you most hungry? What time of day are you least hungry? And this is something that you, even going forward, it's a good tidbit for you to know. When you are most hungry is actually not when I recommend loading up more food. Mm. Sometimes it is, but when you are most hungry, remember you have, that is every signal in your body telling you that at that point, you're probably gonna start tapping into fat stores, more than likely, okay? AMPK is elevating. So when you are most hungry as a time of day, that's a, that's a period where maybe it's good to go for a walk and utilize that, mm. you know, rather than impulse response, Pavlovian response, I get hungry, I need to eat. We need to break that, because that's, that's purely up here, okay? Like, yeah. you're, not, you're not starving, it's a hunger response. That was my, my nighttime, so my nighttime cravings are always the worst. Yeah. <laughs> that's when I want, yeah. Um, it used to be carbs, I don't crave carbs anymore, but now it's like at night, sometimes I'll crave like a chopstick or just something salty and, and savory. Uh, so yeah, again, that goes back to when I was saying that, you know, the dinner fasting was the hardest thing for me to adjust to, uh, this time around. Uh, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That's when I should, yeah, I should jump rope or something. <laughs> yeah. Or just do something. It doesn't, yeah. need to, it doesn't need to be crazy. Yeah, yeah. And usually when you're most satiated, that's, you know, every kind of biological cue is telling your body, okay, well I'm in uh, sort of accumulation mode at that point in time. If you listen to those cues, right? So. But pay attention to the times of day that you get hungry. It really does make a big difference. And every person is different. I talk to people, oh, I'm always hungry around 11 a.m. For me, I'm like never hungry around 11 a.m. I'm never hungry before yeah. like 1 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> never. <laughs> that could just be the conditioning from us. We've done so much intermittent yeah. fasting where, again, how much of it becomes Pavlovian, right? How much of it becomes, yeah. we just... Well, I would say even as a kid, like, I don't know why I, my mom, well, growing up, like the, it, they always say breakfast was the most important meal of the day. And I always hated that. Like, I'd always feel bloated after I eat breakfast. I never liked breakfast um, and you know my mom growing up whenever I go out on the bus to go to school she's like oh you need to eat you need to eat and I hated it but I always force fed myself to eat in the mornings um, so I don't know maybe, maybe it's like a, my body was always telling me you don't need to eat in the morning and you should fast a little bit longer um, could be could be because I don't know I don't know if it's like a, even a genetic thing or if it's like a nature versus nurture I don't know I think but, it's a little all of the above, of both. even microbiome, mm. right? I think there's, mm. it's, there's so many different pieces and so many different circadian clock genes. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some really interesting studies like BMC Medical Genomics did some cool stuff, one of my is favorite studies. A, is it, is it, is it, is circadian rhythm, is that a genetic thing? Because I've always been a night person. Even when I was a kid, like I'd be up until 2 or 3 a.m. as like a six-year-old. <laughs> so, yeah, so I don't know, like I've always been a night guy. Yeah, so genetic, as far as like genetics being passed on in your lineage and you know, that I don't know, but mm. as far as is it a genetic thing, as far as it is ex it's expressed at a genetic level, yes, but 
a big, you know, nuancy difference between the genes that you maybe get from your mom and dad versus like genes that are being expressed and what's actually happening, right? We always have genes that are being expressed uh, to express uh, proteins to be created or proteins to be activated that might trigger a specific sense within our body, right? So genes are always undergoing expression. And that means like, basically it's a fancy word of saying genes being activated. Yeah. So when you talk about things at a genetic level, the circadian clocks 100% are mm. definitely dictated by you know, what genes are being expressed and nuclear receptor proteins, PDAR alpha, all kinds of complicated gobbledygook that can be as simple as, oh, when we look at sunlight, right? You look at sunlight, all of a sudden, like the sunlight, that triggers a gene expression to express more in the way of uh, different neurotransmitters. And it's very long cascades. Sure. So what we eat and our lifestyle, and then genes can be expressed based upon habit, based upon things we've done over time and time and time, because mm. the body is always trying to find efficiency. Yeah. So if it, there's a habit, something that's there, the body is going to, from a survival mechanism, just try to say, well, how do I streamline this? Mm. And if he doesn't normally eat, it would be inefficient for me to try to cue him to eat at this time. Gotcha. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I've, I, it's, it, no matter where I go in the world, like my body always adjusts to like a nighttime schedule. Um, it's it, like within a week, it's crazy. And uh, it's like, I've always wanted to be a morning person, but it's, I just, I don't know. I don't function as well in the morning. Um, so yeah, I'll always be like, Ross, hey, you want to come work out with me at eight? No, you're like, no, no, how about, how about I'm one? still asleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And it doesn't really work for my acting schedule all the time. And sometimes I can be miserable because, it's, you know, for uh, acting schedule sometimes goes from like 6 a.m. till 8 p.m. And um, the night shoot, so I'm always, that's my favorite time to shoot. So, <laughs> yeah, man, that's a topic for a different video. Yeah, though. for sure. <laughs> but it's interesting, though, and I don't want to, you know, go down a rabbit hole too much, but I did a specific video on how intermittent fasting and uh, uh, PPAR alpha, PPAR gamma, which are basically nuclear receptor proteins that get activated with fat adaptation and fasting, will actually have an effect on circadian rhythm. So people hmm. that are fasting can usually get by with less sleep, but also have a better ability, oh. seemingly, at least in rodent models, okay? Like, disclaimer, rodent models, seem to adapt to changes in time zones and things like that better, which is just, again. That's actually interesting because um, when I went to Taiwan, I actually adjusted very quickly to, to the jet lag. Like all, all the other castmates, they were jet lagged for a week and a half. I was almost adjusted in like a day or two. And actually when I came back, it was the same deal. Coming back was a little bit worse, but I wasn't fasting as much. So that's a really interesting correlation. Because um, when I went, I was keto and fasting in order to prep for the role. Um, and then even when I was there, I was fasting because I was stuck in a hotel room and I was like, ah, I, don't, I don't need to eat. Uh, but yeah, that, that's again, another interesting diversion, but and, and, and a topic for another video. But. Well, I mean, I, you know, and you mentioned not liking to have uh, bigger breakfasts, and, and it's something that I've battled with too. It's something I talk about quite frequently. On the days you're not fasting, however, I have you eating a decently good-sized breakfast. Mm -hmm. And I know that might have been something that was difficult for you to uh, swallow at first, no pun intended. Yeah. But the reason behind that is, as much as I don't like to agree with the breakfast is the most important meal of the day, there's a lot of good evidence that shows on the days you are eating breakfast, okay, the operative words there, the days you are eating breakfast, not if you're, if you're intermittent fasting and skipping breakfast doesn't apply, right? But on the days you are eating breakfast, having a larger breakfast does work in your favor by going, the saying is eat uh, breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper, mm. and like decrease calories as you go throughout the day, just because again, from a gene expression level at a genetic level, you are less likely to store excess calories in the morning than you would be in the evening. Okay. And also, just simply from an emotional standpoint, if you are satiated by having a big breakfast, even if it makes you feel sluggish, which I completely, there's a caveat there, right? Mm -hmm. But even if it were to make you feel sluggish, but you had a big breakfast, and you had a long, stressful day at work, and then you come home for, for dinner, and you're, or around dinner, and you're satiated, you're much less likely to do that raiding the pantry kind of thing. Because the yeah. last thing you want to do is be hungry when you're also emotionally exhausted. Yeah. So at the end of the day, your prefrontal cortex is probably more exhausted. Your decision-making capabilities are less, whether you want to appreciate that or not. Mm -hmm. And being hungry at that time is not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's when you reach for the chips or the, yeah, you just want comfort, you know? Yeah. I, I was having a hard time with that. <laughs> so it was like, you have big breakfast, 
and then kind of like staggering off throughout the day. Yeah. But anyway, and then now, I mean, again, we'll, I guess we'll get to that, but I made some adjustments where we, okay, we, we're kind of 86ing the, the dinner skipping, and we're going back to breakfast skipping for two reasons. One, it's just going to fit the schedule more for what we're doing now mm -hmm. going forward. You know, we're, what, five, six weeks in. But also, uh, it's simply to change it up, just mm -hmm. because I'm always liking to, to experience fasting through different periods of time in the day. Mm. You know, it's like, because fasting, like, casts benefits over whatever you are doing at that point in time in certain ways. Mm. So if you're only fasting throughout X hours of the day, perhaps you're only getting benefits of fasting through those X hours of day. Let's, let's shuffle the fasting around so it's casting this shadow of benefits over a different period of time throughout, you know what I mean? We're yeah, constantly yeah. changing it up. Yeah. And I think that's also good for the body. It's uh, like, with working out and the diet is to change things up. It's just, you know... Muscle, muscle confusion or body confusion yeah. or just stress. I think stress is good for the body in different ways, you know, so. Um, and also like variety helps you keep motivated in my experience. Um, I, I know it's different for most people, but I, it's like when I'm jumping into something new or if I'm like actively changing and, and I'm able to see the results, I'm a lot more motivated because I want to see how things change and, and how my sleep changes and, and how my energy changes. So um, yeah, and then yeah, again, to fit the schedule because I'm leaving next week <laughs> for a foreign country. So you're, you're a unique piece, though, because you're, you're a, like a curious individual, right? Like that's yeah. it's not always that case. Mm -hmm. And I try to speak to that curiosity in people. Like if you become curious and interested in what's happening in your body, it's it's, it's it, yeah, it's giving you this intrinsic motivation. Yeah. OK, so now we move into uh, week some, three. Yeah, week three, so March 8th. All right. And this is pretty cool because now we're at, well, just to give reference from the last week. Okay. So total body fat, you took a huge dive in body fat uh, yeah. this week. So from 228 to 38. So this is a... So eight days. But yeah. Because it was February is a short month. Always confuses me. You went from 20.1% body fat to 18.5%. Yeah. All right. So we, <laughs> basically 1.5% in a yeah. week. Okay. Your lean tissue went from 145.6 to 150.3, which is just yeah. like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. Uh, you know, like weird, everything else is like right in line, right? And then I think on this one, I didn't bring your, uh, I don't have your visceral adipose tissue readout on this first page, but we can show it on the screen. Uh, you know, you had some decreases there, but yeah. this is nuts. And this, at this point, being three-ish or three -ish weeks in, you're probably starting to feel like alive, like you're not yes. feeling fatigued anymore. There was a definite switch over between week two and three where my stamina came back, my intensity came back. Um, yeah, I was more fat adapted. I was getting used to the, the, the dinner fasting, just everything clicked. And I psychologically felt a very different uh, person w within those two weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I jumped up five pounds of lean muscle and I, and I still lost one and a half percent body fat. And that's exactly what we were going for is me leaning out for this role, but also maintaining my muscle, if not growing it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that week was like, and this was three weeks in, this isn't like, you know, right off the bat, it, I don't think you would even consider it newbie gains or whatever. Um, it, it was, uh, yeah, that was a good week. <laughs> well, and we can, and just to give context, I mean, we can jump right ahead to the present week mm -hmm. where you went out of town you had like, lived life a little bit you weren't yeah you know, I went so I went to Austin Texas and I I love Austin for the barbecue I had to go get some barbecue yeah. I had to have some barbecue sauce uh I stayed away from like cornbread and everything but um, yeah well I mean you're still your results were pretty like okay so in this case lean tissue went down a smidget okay mm -hmm. now but body fat stayed about the same went mm -hmm. up 0.1 percent okay mm -hmm. but your total uh total weight actually had dropped. So your total yeah. mass in pounds went from 194.7 to 194 uh, even. Mm -hmm. Now that's, let's see, we had a, and that's attributed in this case to the lean tissue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, slight lean tissue drop. What is interesting is your visceral adipose tissue, this is the one where, I mean, you just came to me today, we're like, I was like, I don't know how this happened. Like I, cause I didn't work out at all that weekend for like four days. I was in Austin, I was eating three meals a day, <laughs> like barbecue. Um, and my visceral adipose tissue went down. It was probably one of the bigger drops. Um, and I, I didn't understand how that happened. Cause I was, you know, there's sugar in the barbecue sauce. 
Uh, there was like a little bit of carbs here and there and the things I was eating, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I, it, but still my VAT was dropping, yeah, even that's though everything else maintained. Um, <laughs> after not working out and just eating, so that could be one of those things. And drinking, just, <laughs> yeah, drinks is, yeah, I had some tequila. Just, as well, we so. just don't know, right? Yeah. It's like one of those things. Like, but also, I mean, sometimes just relaxing and having a little bit of flexibility can also do some positive things. What's interesting mm -hmm. is, I mean, this is a negligible change in lean tissue, mm -hmm. um, very negligible change in body fat. That's almost uh, statistically insignificant, like yeah. a point, point one, one percent. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be worried about that. And then I guess a question for you, based upon this, because I'm like analyzing this in my mind. Do you think that you uh, went off diet enough to be out of ketosis for any extended period of time? I, honestly, I couldn't tell you. I don't feel like I did, um, especially. But you weren't like blatantly being like, I'm gonna have some bread rolls. Like, yeah, no, no, yeah. no, I still stayed away from Kind of like the, the main thing, like no cornbread, no desserts, no cookies, not, 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 no grains, no rice, nothing like that. No, I still had, uh, still had my greens, uh, collard greens, lettuce and salads and stuff. But I, I, I stuck mainly to these pillars that I'm talking about, just you know, not any crazy carbs. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, um, I feel like when, on, when you're on keto, and then you get out of keto, you can feel it, mm -hmm. um, you, sluggishness or heaviness, and I didn't really feel any of that, so. The only reason I asked wasn't, it was, wasn't to put you on the spot, it's yeah. to say, you know, if you felt like, okay, yeah, there was a point in time where I, yes, absolutely clear as day was out of ketosis at this point in time, it would make sense that maybe your lean tissue would drop a little bit because, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe you lost some of the muscle sparing effects temporarily mm -hmm. of being in ketosis. Um, you know, one of the things that I would say, like if you're going into a situation like that again, that is a good time to utilize exogenous ketones, right? Gotcha. And mm -hmm. I don't want to say use exogenous ketones as a crutch, uh, but they do offer a little bit of a buffer. So like mm -hmm. in a situation like that, where, okay, I'm transitioning from using fats over to possibly using carbs, because I maybe had 20 grams of carbs from barbecue sauce, and mm -hmm. maybe I snuck a couple bites of this bread roll, maybe it added up. You know, having those exogenous ketones might allow you to at least have the muscle sparing effect to kind of continue. Gotcha. But I, I mean, I, I say that with like very much caution that that is only something that would really work in a fat adapted individual and would mm -hmm. only work in like strange use cases. I don't, I don't believe in leaning into a supplement to, to like get a desired outcome. It's yeah. something that you use as a, a tool there. And that, I mean, that just makes sense. But we also might be reaching a point where you are not necessarily storing as much in the way of muscle glycogen. So you might find that, I mean, you can't gain five pounds of lean body mass a week forever, right? Yeah. I mean, and everyone would be Mr. Olympia. So yeah. there is a certain point where, um, yeah, that's probably going to cap out and that's going to, uh, you know, decrease a little bit. So, you know, kind of what we've done going forward with you is we're introducing a few more carbs here and there. Mm -hmm. And especially surrounding the workouts when you're, you know, shipping out to go do this production, we have you actually adding like four ounces to six ounces of red potato, maybe some beets in there, mm -hmm. uh, still keeping you off of grains. And I'm not like this anti-grain guy, but something happens and it's somewhat indescribable. People that are doing a lower carb protocol, when they have grains, it seems to like bloat them a lot and they, hmm. I don't know what it is, right? I, I really don't and I can't like. And it's weird, I actually took a food sensitivity test a few months ago and I'm not really sensitive to anything except rice. And I've been eating rice my entire life, and, I, and I've never felt like I was sensitive to it. But I mean, I guess you don't really feel it. But um, yeah, they said one of the only things that I was sensitive to was rice. So hmm. I, I've been trying to cut down on rice, even though I love rice. But um, so it's it's funny you say that because uh, yeah, I guess whenever I eat it, I get super inflamed and I get bloated. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a weird situation. And yeah. for you, if you've been eating it a lot, then it could be one of those things where like a food sensitivity test can sometimes give you a readout. I don't want to say that it's false, but if it's something that you consume a lot of, mm -hmm. then you may simply have antibodies to it. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you have an intolerance to it, but it means that it's something your body recognizes as a food that's consumed a lot, so you have yeah. a natural antibody response. Mm -hmm. May or may not be worth paying attention to, but it can sometimes happen. Yeah. Just, so it doesn't always mean it's a bad thing. Right. But yeah, it's by, I think you're gonna find by adding like the potatoes, the beets in, like a small amount post-workout, if we were to measure your DEXA, which is gonna be, I don't know, if you find a place you know, to do it there, yeah. yeah, then it'd be interesting to see, because I think you would find that 
body fat might go up a smidget on paper for like the first week, but it's not gonna really be body fat per se. It's gonna be probably water that sometimes mm. can read as body fat on Dexa. It's nuancy. Mm. But I think you'll find that the super saturation of the muscle with glycogen from extra carbohydrates, it's gonna show your lean tissue going up quite a bit. Okay. Uh, you find these kind of results on a DEXA with like big increases in muscle like that. Usually you see when someone goes ketogenic for a long period of time and then carb loads, mm. because what will happen is it's a hyper responsiveness. The muscles suck up so much glucose, all of a sudden your lean tissue looks a lot more, right? Yeah. And your ratio of lean tissue. Does it happen with creatine? Do you think? Because I, I did, uh, I, I told you before, I was taking creatine up until Friday, and then for the for four days, I didn't take it at all while I wasn't working out. So that also might. It's a very good point. That's yeah. a very good, this is what I mean. Like when I say like Ross is educated in this world based upon things he's watched and things he's seen and things we've talked about, it's exactly the point like that I want to drive home in terms of like what you gather from videos, just take little pieces of it. So creatine, yes, can trigger you know, intracellular volume to increase. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's a, definitely a volumizing agent in that respect. Yeah. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the exact half-life of a creatine supplement is, mm -hmm. but I know that generally it's out of your system like in like four or five days, right? That's why you yeah. typically take five grams like every day, two and a half to five grams every day. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I will say it, one of the most heavily documented, demonstrated ergogenic aids that's out there, caffeine, mm -hmm creatine and carnitine as far as mm. like ergogenic aids are pretty heavily researched. And those are the three that I can say without, without much doubt are pretty solid, right? Mm -hmm. So you have you taking a bit of creatine. You coming off of it, yes, that would absolutely affect lean mass. Mm. Um, that might account and for, yeah. Exactly, yeah, that, that small that. amount. And that would, I would say, would probably be about the, the most that you would see because it's mm -hmm. probably out of your system at that point. It's mm -hmm. been, um, so very interesting point with that. So like any little like supplement that's gonna trigger water retention or anything like that can influence that. Uh, the whole loading phase thing with creatine that people talk about isn't really a thing. You don't need mm -hmm. to like load creatine. And I say that because there's gonna be people that might pick apart the video and say, oh, well, creatine influenced the lean body mass changes. They would influence it within like the first seven to 10 days, but they wouldn't be influencing those three, that week three change. Mm -hmm. That's what's really, that's the most interesting week to me was that like huge leap yeah. that you made uh, when fat adaptation had really occurred. Yeah, crazy. And <laughs> as far as, so what's your, what was your training looking like as far as strength training throughout this period of time too? Uh, so my strength training, uh, so I was doing two workouts a day, and I would do strength training for an hour, take a 30-minute break, and then go into the more cardio-focused MMA. So they weren't super intense because I had to save up energy to do MMA conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was like 40, 50% intensity, um, just like medium reps, just not going out of my mind and not getting myself to exhaustion after everyone, but it was it's more just to start building again. Uh, which is crazy again because of this lean muscle mass jump when the workouts really weren't even super intense. Um, and then also like during MMA, we're not doing weight training, we're, we're doing conditioning, more cardio focus. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still a little bewildered by, <laughs> by how we got these results. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't want to encourage people to only have half workouts, but there's yeah. actually some pretty interesting data that's come out recently uh, showing that like, training to failure isn't necessary. Mm. I just had Stan Efferding, I don't know if you know Stan Efferding, uh, is on my channel. He's very well known in that he was, anyway, in the, just kind of the, the muscle building world. As far as, I haven't had him on my channel, but Dr. Mike Isritol has talked about this a lot too. Uh, it shows that like if you go to like 60, 70 percent of your max, mm -hmm. and 60, 70 percent of failure, the gains are only a smidget less than if you went all the way to failure. And which is interesting though, because like, take your pick, like what do you wanna do? Do you wanna to train to absolute failure, get your ego rocks off, and then be debilitated mm -hmm. and not be able to train? Or would you rather get a smidget less results, but train at 60, 70% and actually be able to train the next day? Yeah. So it's really, it becomes a consistency thing. And I think that's what you've noticed because there's been times when, you know, yeah, like, I've worked with you and trained you and you're like, I can't move. Yeah, we go, we go 100% and yeah. And that's, that's a mental thing, right? Yeah, like, I yeah. really like to push Every that. Every once in a while, yeah. yeah. So no, not, I, I, I've been saying, so like I, by going 50, 60%, um, mentally, 
yeah, uh, I, I feel more solid because my joints aren't as achy because uh, I have you know lower back issues, I have shoulder issues, but training at the lower intensity uh, has helped me stay more consistent. Um, and because of that, yeah, maybe that's what's led to me being able to work out twice a day, five days a week and not get burnt out and still, and not have a crazy appetite. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's this whole, the whole last five weeks has been really mind boggling yeah. to me because it, it goes against almost everything that I've known historically from, from working out of like, you need to eat constantly or you need to eat so much and you need to go hundred percent for every single workout. Um, this has been a really eye opening last month and a half. I mean, times they are changing for yeah. sure. As far as like what works in terms of nutrition science, fitness yeah. science, everything like that things we used to believe we have a lot more ability to test them now and yeah. people have the, a lot more ability to test things on their own. Yeah. I mean, school. with the DEXA scan <laughs> stuff, it's insane. Just being able to track all of it. It's, yeah, that, that's been, and also very motivating. So, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, this, this is crazy. This is the first time I've ever done a week by week thing. And just to see the use results, it, it's, yeah, it, it makes me question everything that I've learned in the past. <laughs> Which honestly, I mean, and I kind of, just to wrap everything up, I think that's a great point. Like everyone should question everything, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. it's, there's so much constant emerging science. Like, and I don't want to say everyone should be a skeptic, but yeah. in the world of content on the internet, Everyone should be a skeptic. You should even be skeptical of even the content that I put out simply because you will be able to find something that contradicts what I say. And you will be able to find something that contradicts what Lane Norton says or what Stan Efferding says. It's just the way that it is. Yeah. And there's a practical use case. And if you remain a consistent skeptic, but also at the same time have faith in what will work, that can play a big role. Yeah. And I think it, it, also every single body is different. Like you said, you know, my body after doing keto three or four times now, uh, fat adapts relatively quickly. And I, I know what to expect. Um, the versus someone that's doing it for the first time, like maybe you don't get these results. And also maybe genetically, you're talking about gene expression, maybe your body responds differently to, to different things. Uh, yeah, at the, in the end, it's what, whatever works for you. And if you're able to monitor it and you're able to actually figure out what exactly works and how and to what extent it works, that's the most powerful uh, belief system, you know, because for me now I know like doing what we did over the last six weeks has a profound effect on my body and maybe it's just me and you know, maybe for you it's different or another client that you have. But now we know like moving forward that, you know, this is a basis for what we can do and we can build off of this. It's, it's incredible and it, and it took the DEXA scans and me seeing it to really drive it into my brain <laughs> and, and, to, and to be like, yes, this, this, this works. Absolutely, man. And it's the end of the day. Everyone needs to be their own N equals one. You need to experiment on yourself because mm -hmm. you can have a meta analysis with 127,000 people, but in a lot of ways, you might be a unique butterfly. It's just yeah. the way that things are. So, yeah. well, as always, keep it locked in here. And Ross, as always, man, it's thanks, brother. See you, bro. yeah. see you guys.